the Catholic Church out of that and into a new light. You know, just the other day, uh, Pope Francis came up with something called Bat Christians, and he said, a Bat Christian is someone who likes to live in the dark and is afraid of the light. And he said, don't be Bat Christians. Come out into the light and uh, share the good news. And I think that's really what he's trying to encourage people to do. I guess the next, can the next uh, natural question is, what is next? Who might be the next candidate for sainthood, and I know that the two of you mentioned Mother Teresa. Is she a shoe in Oh, listen, I mean, I don't think anybody here has any serious doubt that sooner or later uh, it's going to be Saint Teresa. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really just a question of time. I mean, you know, Vatican officials often say that, you know, they don't set the pace of sainthood causes, God does, because it's a question of how long it takes for that second miracle to sort of work its way through the system. But, uh, but no, I don't think anybody has any serious doubt that that's how it's going to end. Uh, I think one other, sort of the missing pope in all of this, I mean, one other, you know, candidate we might be looking for would, of course, be Pope Paul VI, you know, the second pope of the Second Vatican Council, uh, or, for that matter, another contemporary pope who, who, uh, whose process is underway would be John Paul I, the smiling pope of 33 days. So we might look to see whether there's movement in either of those two causes. Well, you know, one of the most controversial uh, cases, uh, causes for uh, sainthood is Pope Pius XII. And uh, that one has been uh, going on for some time. He was pope during the Second World War, and there are those who infamously called him Hitler's pope uh, in the sense that he, was, he has been accused of not doing enough to help the Jews during that time, something the Vatican vehemently denies and uh, has come out over the years to try and give evidence uh, to point to uh, what Pius XII did to help the Jews during that time. But it's a, it's a highly debated cause and has been uh, for some time. Uh, so that will be interesting. Pope Benedict decided to wait uh, and gather more information on that situation. I think because it was it, it, it is such a hot issue. It will be interesting to see what Pope Francis does with that. One other blockbuster potential saint we might look for would be Oscar Romero. Yes. Uh, the martyred Archbishop of El Salvador in 1980 shot while saying mass, who was a hero to the liberation theology movement. Uh, and that cause, although he has a tremendous grassroots following all over Latin America, that cause has been blocked for a while. Francis, however, coming from Latin America may be the one to kick it loose. Yeah. Delia Gallagher there and John Allen giving us fantastic analysis uh, just outside Vatican City on this momentous day. Thanks to you both. They're, of course, not going anywhere. CNN will continue to cover uh, this important day for the more than a billion Catholics around the world. And it's been a remarkable one that we've watched it so sure far. It sure has been quite remarkable. The image is very moving, a solemn day, but also one filled with so much excitement as we've been hearing from Ben Wiedemann on the ground there. He says he felt a, an electricity there in the air as this historic unprecedented event has been taking place the first time that two popes have been canonized on the same day we should also mention that none of this would have been possible without those three miracle women the women who uh, say they were cured uh, by praying to Pope John Paul II and Pope John uh, John the 23rd uh, who was present as lo along with Sister Marie uh, Simone Pierre, but yes, as you were saying, Errol, quite a remarkable day, and we thank you so much for joining us on our live coverage of the canonization of two popes just becoming a saint. But stay with us here at CNN. Our coverage continues after this. Guardemos silencio por unos instantes y permanezcamos en oración. live pictures of the Vatican on an historic day. We've just seen two popes elevated to sainthood. Hello again, everyone. I'm Errol Barnett. And I'm Amara Walker. To viewers in the United States and around the world, you're watching a special edition of CNN Newsroom. Now, this is the first time in history that a dual ceremony was held to turn two late popes into saints. This is something the Catholic Church has never done before. And if you were watching here on CNN, you saw 
as Pope Francis led a special mass at St. Peter's Basilica to canonize John the 23rd and John Paul II. It's quite a scene there. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims from around the world have traveled to Vatican City for this event. We also heard about those marathon runners who ran from Poland uh, to be at St. Peter's Square for this unprecedented, remarkable Which is just event. incredible. It really is. To just, run there. Exactly. And Ben was mentioning that when they arrived, they had a hard time getting in because the crowds were just so large. Pope Emeritus Benedict uh, the 16th is also attending this ceremony. We saw a lot of live pictures of him there. It's perhaps his highest profile event since he stepped down last year. Some 150 cardinals, a thousand bishops, are also in attendance as well as at least 24 world leaders. Now let's uh, take a look at today's pomp and the pageantry there at the Vatican as Pope John the 23rd and Pope John Paul II were made saints in the Catholic Church. Watch this. Beatissime Pater, instanter postulat sancta mater ecclesia, in nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. sights and sounds from this morning in Vatican City. The um, official canonization has completed. We understand Mass is underway now. Pope Francis, you see him there speaking to the faithful. If we have translation on this, let's listen in to what he's saying. Especially close. And now, we turn our prayer to the Virgin Mary, to the Virgin Mary, who Saint John the 23rd and Saint John Paul the Second, loved as true sons. Vatican correspondent Delia Gallagher and senior Vatican analyst John Allen have been guiding us through all of this. They are just outside the Vatican overlooking uh, St. Peter's Square. Uh, if you could take us back through the day's events today, it's been quite remarkable to see these images and you can really feel uh, the emotion. It's such a poignant moment uh, that we've been seeing uh, repeat itself throughout the day. What images stuck out to the two of you, Delia? Well, I think, Amara, what strikes me about today is this kind of uh, a mixture of a very solemn ceremony and then a very joyous uh, and moving crowd. You know, we've been here all night with the people 
who have been sleeping down here waiting for this moment. Uh, and, and so we see this kind of uh, juxtaposition of uh, all of the cardinals, the Pope, everybody on the altar. And then you've got people down here in sleeping bags. I mean, something doesn't seem quite right about it. Yet at the same time, that's exactly what makes it such an interesting event because uh, we have a very formal, solemn uh, Vatican ceremony. And then we have people camping out here. Uh, so there's a kind of, you can feel that kind of devotion uh, from the people who are fully participating, by the way, in all of the prayers of the Mass. I mean, there is a silence here when they're listening to the prayers um, that is always quite incredible in, in a crowd of more than a million people. Yeah. Emory, you asked about the, the most striking or arresting image that we've seen today. I mean, the, the day has been full of remarkable images, but, you know, for my money, one of the most striking was seeing Pope Francis go over and greet the 87-year-old Benedict XVI with that kind of very warm, affectionate hug between the two men. And that's in part because, you know, the, the, the one of the themes of this day has been unity among figures that the outside world sometimes would like to pit against one another. Yes. You know, the, the outside world and even some factions inside the Catholic Church love to pit Pope John XXIII against Pope John Paul II, and Francis has kind of pulled the rug out from one of them by, by this act of putting it together. And again, some would like to pit Pope Benedict against Pope Francis, again, as if Pope Benedict represents the sort of forces of conservatism, and Francis is the radical progressive. Yeah. Uh, and once again, you see in that one image of the two men embracing one another, how what is truly fundamental for a Catholic who takes the faith seriously uh, is not what separates us, but what brings us together. Yeah, Pope Francis has made some effort in this first year of his pontificate to include Pope Benedict, uh, at least to ask for his advice uh, on some issues and make sure that it was also known that uh, he consults Pope Benedict and listens uh, to what the Pope Emeritus has to say. And I think that has gone some way to easing some people's fears about how this was going to work with the two popes. Right, and in fact, one of the reasons Benedict is here today is because Francis told him he wants him to get out of the house more often. He gave an interview when he said, this man is not a fossil. He's not off in a museum someplace. You know, I want to see him out and about. Yeah. Uh, and so we see the two of them together here today. Yes, and we're hearing the, the, the crowds clapping now. Uh, we've come basically to the to the conclusion the Pope earlier was saying hello in different languages and greeting uh, some of the people. Uh, he does the Angelus, which is the prayer we just heard, which happens every Sunday here at the Vatican. Usually the Pope comes to the window of the Apostolic Palace where Popes used to live uh, and does a short prayer and then greets all of the people. And of course today is Sunday, so even after the Mass, he did uh, do the Angelus prayer today. It's a prayer that many Catholics do at noon uh, on any day. Now we see him going over once again to embrace Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, who of course was a longtime collaborator of John Paul II. I think it's only right that he should be uh, here today. Uh, and that, of course, remember uh, Joseph, then father Joseph Ratzinger, the man who became Benedict XVI, uh, was also what's known as a Peritus, that is a theological expert at the Second Vatican Council during the era of John XXIII. So I, I think, honestly, as, as odd as it may be to see two living popes together, given how close Pope Benedict was both to John the Twenty-Third and the Council he called, and John Paul II, who he served as his right-hand man, the idea of having this canonization ceremony without Benedict present would have been almost unthinkable. Yes, absolutely. The Pope will go down now and probably greet a few more of the people who are there, and then we know he's going to take a little trip in his Popemobile, they tell us, and, uh, and greet the crowds, as he usually does during his Wednesday audience, so we'll see if he's able to do that with all of these crowds here. Yeah, listen, I mean, if Francis is able to make his way through this sea of humanity that we have here today, then when it's time to beatify him, maybe that could count as his first miracle, because that's going to be something interesting to watch. Absolutely. Amra, Errol? All right, we're listening there to Delia Gallagher and John Allen. Uh, they're just outside Vatican City as we watch this historic day uh, for the Catholic Church. And then once again, seeing um, Pope Francis embrace 
Pope Emeritus Benedict them holding hands there for quite a firm um, uh, shake. Yeah, it's quite remarkable to see two living popes uh, along with uh, two deceased popes at one ceremony. This is a historic event, and as you can see, hundreds of thousands, or as John Allen has been describing, the sea of humanity uh, has uh, filled St. Peter's Square for this uh, just incredible event as we are seeing. Ben Wiedemann is standing by there in St. Peter's Square. He joins us on the phone uh, with with the atmosphere there, Ben. What's it like down there? Well, it's still very crowded, but with the ceremony starting to wind up, uh, we're seeing many of the people who had uh, slept in the area around here starting to roll up their sleeping bags, fold up their chairs, uh, and possibly go home. But it's going to take a while uh, simply because the sheer mass of people, hundreds of thousands of people in St. Peter's Square and the adjacent uh, areas. Now, many of the people just a few minutes ago who went to take uh, communion that uh, was handed out uh, by priests throughout uh, the crowd as well. It's been a very sort of solemn morning, not uh, a lot of celebration. Many people are uh, on their knees praying, some people uh, crying when it was announced uh, that now Pope John Paul II and John XXIII uh, had been declared uh, as saints. Now lots of people are taking one another's pictures. Uh, generally, I think the atmosphere is starting to lighten up a bit now that uh, uh, the ceremony is over. Keeping in mind that a lot of the people who are here basically slept in sleeping bags on the ground in the streets and the park uh, around St. Peter's Square. Uh, many of them came a very long way Basically, what you see here is people from all four corners of the earth who have come to pay their respects to these uh, these very large figures in the history of the Catholic Church. Ben Wiedemann speaking with us on the phone. You're watching Pope Francis there meet and welcome dignitaries at the altar area of St. Peter's Square, approaching the end of Mass just before he gets into uh, the now world-famous Pope Mobile and uh, tours the area to welcome those around. Ben, if you can still hear me, actually, we don't have Ben at the moment, but we're watching here as um, Pope Francis welcomes world leaders there. Spanish royals, Vatican yeah, City. King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia uh, as he's greeting them. It's uh, quite interesting to see so many dignitaries lined up here for this event. Obviously, a very uh, significant and important uh, ceremony for them to be in attendance. Let's bring in Delia Gallagher uh, and, and John Allen one more time and, and take us through what we are seeing now. So uh, the Pope will be greeting uh, the dignitaries here at the altar and then he's off to the, the Pope Mobile. <laughs>
can even hear the atmosphere, the music, the James, noise, yes, jump up upbeat, right? as we move to the next phase of this ceremony. And, and let's talk a bit about what we expect to see now, the Pope Mobile moment. Pope Francis has shown himself to be very comfortable um, with large crowds, but I'm wondering how stressed out papal security is right now, knowing that he right. may want to jump out of the vehicle and, and shake hands and, of course, touch people as well.
despite the problems of security. Well, I mean, we can't forget, at the bottom of, of it all, you know, in terms of the roles that popes play, in their hearts, they are pastors. That is, they are caretakers of souls. And so they really do care about the individual people, yeah. you know, that they come into contact with, and they want to project that. And, and uh, I think that's what all this is about, in a way. Uh, and, and we see that drive in a particular way with Francis, and his the, just the zest, the joy, yeah. you know, uh, he takes in encountering the ordinary folks who turn out to see him. And obviously when he can't go out, he calls them. <laughs> oh, he's the cold call pope. I mean, you know, he's forever calling people out of the blue. Uh, he's just on our fact, I'm the last guy I know who has not you gotten a pope called, phone no. call. I'm like waiting either. for the phone to ring. I haven't either. Maybe it'll happen oh, today. Yeah. You know, and John, I have to, I, I love your analogies, and I have to quote you again. You know, the crowds behind you, very large, and you call them, or liken them to a Catholic Mardi Gras on steroids. And clearly, you know, these large crowds are obviously a, a sign just how popular uh, Pope Francis is, but also uh, how beloved and embraced uh, the other two uh, popes are now, Saints John Paul II and John uh, the Twenty Third uh, are. But, you know, we also want to talk about this unprecedented double canonization, uh, bringing together Three, the three most popular leaders of the Catholic Church of the past century. That's and right. We've all, we've all been talking yeah. about this and these leaders being so popular because Pope Francis and the popes who have become saints all share this either a humble approach or humble upbringing. Our senior international correspondent Jim Bittman found out what made John Paul II and John XXIII so well loved. Overnight, it seems, the tourist shops around Vatican Square are packing in new lines of trinkets and books. Their focus? Two former popes. And sales are booming. Usually we send more small images, cards, with the prayer, or also the rosaries with the images. They are sold very well. Never before have two popes been turned into saints on the same day. And Catholics and non-Catholics alike are curious, not only about Pope John XXIII and John Paul II themselves, but also why they should become saints, and why the unprecedented double canonization. Part of it goes back 50 years to the Second Vatican Council, called by John XXIII to modernize the church. The young bishop, Carol Voitio, who was to become John Paul II, was a part of those meetings too. But in the end, the council left the church divided between those who wanted more reform and those who wanted to stick with tradition. Those who knew both men will tell you that Pope Francis is now trying to heal that rift by canonizing two council participants who have come to represent those opposing views. The Pope is going to bring together in one ceremony the father of the council and the son who put it into action. Others will tell you that the reason for creating two new saints is because they share Catholic values that make them apt role models for our times. Uh, well, it's the uh, official recognition. This is very good popes, and we will, will follow their steps now. But there's another, perhaps less spiritual reason. Call it reflected glory in the most literal sense of the term. For Pope Francis, who's already becoming one of the most popular popes in modern church history, to associate himself with two of his predecessors who are also admired can only enhance his reputation, perhaps strengthen the church. In fact, Francis, John XXIII, and John Paul II are three church superstars coming together for one canonical moment, certain to unite Catholics and perhaps renew their faith. I think it's something uh, very uh, strong. Did, did, did it help you and your faith to know that, that, that yes, the leader yes, of the church yes, is... Of course, of course. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think it's very important for me, yes. So, while the Catholic Church already has thousands of saints, and adding two more might not seem like such a big deal, the double canonization of two popes takes on a historical, theological, and popular significance. Many church fathers hope will give new energy to a most ancient organization. Jim Bitterman, CNN, Rome. And let's take you back now live 